this straight, we can think about it in narrowly defined terms of economic issues that needed to be addressed, or a workplace safety that needed to be addressed. But this was really an uprising. This was the people who had come to this region. They had come from a feudal country in, in, uh, in Eastern and Southern Europe. In Annie's case, her parents, she was born in Calumet, but both of her parents were immigrants from Slovenia. Slovenia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They understood what it meant to be a serf. Serf from only officially ended in Slovenia in 1845. Some of the miners here were born into serfdom. Serfdom is a form of slavery. So they understood what it was to live in a situation where you did not have human rights. They came to the United States, yes, for economic opportunity, but also because this place was, in, was the beacon of democracy where people, ordinary people, could have human rights and full dignity. Unfortunately, in Copper Country, that was not necessarily the case when they got here. This whole place was a company town. This was a popular uprising, and boy, did it take steam in a hurry. Those strike parades were really powerful, and I think it's hard to convey that in the pictures, because you see the pictures and you think, you know, maybe it's just a parade that looks like a turn of the century parade. Now, I think there was really tremendous energy and spirit there that um, those were not authorized events. That was not happening with official approval. Those people got out on the streets taking big risks to do that, at the risk of their jobs. If they lost their job, they could lose their house within two weeks. This was uh, a lot that was at stake. Going out in the front with those flags, she not just was a representative of the strike, she embodied the strike. I think that's what the miners would tell you. And I'm going to call on two people to witness, and let's say one person and one group of people to witness and I think they would agree with me, because I've tried to study this point. The Western Federation of Miners, best field organizer that I can find out, was a fellow named Ben Garden, who was sent here by the union to help organize the strike. This guy was really out on the street every day. He was arrested eight or nine times. He was severely beaten several times. He was really a very solid guy. Ben and Annie, were really close. They, um, I think if we asked Ben Goggin what his opinion was of Annie, is she somebody who embodies what we're trying to do with the labor movement at this point in history, 1913, when we're still trying to, to first have human rights for workers, where workers are not draft animals, they're human beings. I think Ben would say to you, yeah, she is as good as we have got in copper country, she is as good as it gets. That's my belief in your springs. The other witness I would call is a group of 500 miners, and I'm sorry I'm repeating this for people who came last night, who came to a congressional investigation hearing for the strike in February. So the strike was already in deep trouble in February. A lot had happened by then. They had hopes for that congressional investigation. Those hopes were not borne out in terms of hoping that Congress would somehow save them from the mining companies that didn't happen. But there was a lot of miners present in a meeting in Hancock where this committee was first starting to meet. There was 500 miners in the room. There was press there reporting on. Annie walks into the room these miners, these are tough guys. You can't survive in a mine. It's very tough. Um, they spontaneously break into applause when she breaks them, when she walks into the room. She is so embarrassed by this that she actually turns and faces the wall. But the point I'm asking you to consider is what the witness is of 500 copper miners in that era spontaneously break into the wall. I've been living with Andrew for a while now. So, um, this is an emotional moment for me because I feel like, okay, here in her hometown, she's getting some recognition that she did not get during her own lifetime by and large. She did not get it after she moved to Chicago. 
she disappeared from the media after the strike. She was never in the media again you know, until her death in 1956. So this to me is a really powerful moment. So Annie really was a bottle of fire, but she's also a person who had a lot and drew a lot of pain and sacrifice. And we know how much human sacrifice was involved in the Italian hall situation. The Italian hall Christmas party was organized by the Italian men women's WFM local, of which Annie was president. Annie was described as being the principal organizer of that party. The women of the local all got together to help make gifts for the children to put on the party. Actually, there was to be a party for the adults in the evening following the afternoon party for the children. Annie was the MC on the stage at the moment where the children were receiving their gifts and somebody came to the doorway up there on the second floor and yelled fire and started the panic. She was the one who tried to stop the panic. She was telling people there was no fire. She was trying to get the kids because it was almost, you know, 80% kids to stop running to go back to their seats, and she didn't succeed. The, um, she was there through the whole thing. She was actually physically given at least one child to try to revive, um, which she wasn't able to do. She was asked by a reporter, at least according to her press accounts, you know, it sounded like a little bit of a snide report, actually. He said, you know, did you have a child who was killed? You know, like, why are you so upset? Did you have a child who was killed? And she said, they're all my children. Yeah. I think she was speaking from her heart. <laughs> 